Good morning and welcome to this, the 20th year of the India Today Conclave. The nature of warfare is changing at a faster pace than before. What was thought of till recently as the future of war is already the present. Drone warfare, artificial intelligence, cyber attacks are no longer in the realm of a distant future. They define the new revolution in military affairs. At a time when decades-old military strategy is being upturned by technology, our country is fortunate to have at its helm the Chief of the Indian Army Staff, General Manoj Pandey, who is the first engineer to hold this coveted post. He was commissioned into the Bombay Sappers in 1982. In an army dominated so far by generals from the infantry, the artillery, or the armed corps, General Pandey is a technologist par excellence, so he really is the right man at the right place at the right time. And in this session, we hope to learn from the Army Chief about his plans to transform the face of the Indian Army. Ladies and gentlemen at the India Today Conclave, join me in welcoming to this, the 20th year of our Conclave and the inaugural session, the Chief of the Indian Army Staff, General Manoj Pandey. Welcome, sir. I want to start by asking you about the lessons the Indian Army has learned from the Russia-Ukraine war, which is on currently. When you make your battle plans and your preparations, and you're seeing this massive war play out across the landmass of Russia and Ukraine, what are the key lessons you've learned from it? Thank you, Rahul. It's an honor and privilege for me to be talking to you at the India Today Conclave. To answer your question, I think there are very profound lessons that we can learn from the ongoing Russia-Ukraine conflict. And these lessons span across the strategic, operational, as well as tactical domain. But what is important is we need to see their relevance in our context. Let me list out some of the lessons which I feel uh, are extremely relevant to us. And the foremost, and the first and foremost is that it has reaffirmed the relevance of hard power and shown that where national interests are involved, countries would not hesitate to go to war. Secondly, land has, will continue to remain a decisive domain in warfare, especially in our case where we have contested land borders. The notion of victory will remain land-centric in our context. Thirdly, as we move forward, uh, as far as the strategic issues are concerned, the importance of reliance, the duration of war. There was a hypothesis that wars in the future will be short and swift, but that, I think, uh, is something uh, that is being questioned. So the importance of our being self-reliant, our being fully dependent on inherent supply chains is another lesson. From the operational point of view, you have seen multi-domain operations. It is no longer only the contact on the kinetic warfare, but you also have warfare in the domains of cyber, space, EW, and even influence operations or information warfare, or the battles of narratives. So these are some of the important lessons that we need to learn. As far as uh, tactical level issues are concerned, I think there are, again, uh, important lessons in terms of operations by small teams. The citizen warrior, wherein even an average citizen in this case has had an important role to play in the military operations. The relevance of various platforms, the larger platforms vis-a-vis -vis the smaller, the less uh, sort of costlier ones, such as drones. Uh, the importance for a soldier to be multi-skilled so these are some of the lessons at the tactical level. Together, I think all of them have uh, great relevance in our context. In the Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict, we saw the use of drones changing the nature of war and the potential outcome. We've seen jet blacks flying over the water being used to dramatic effect, at least in war games. And we've seen cyber attacks, especially the capabilities that China is said to have built. And as a citizen, I wonder, General Pandey, how prepared is the armed forces for this, the new face of war, which is driven more by technology 
as much as it is by boots on the ground? That's a very relevant question. Modernization and technology infusion uh, has been central to our capability develop plan, uh, development plans. And our attempt has been to see as to how we can leverage the niche as well as disruptive technologies for better use uh, in warfare. And to that extent, we have taken a number of measures to modernize. Uh, of course, one of it is to make sure that we have the right balance of old and the new. We have niche technologies. How, how can we exploit their limitless potential? We have a very vibrant startup ecosystem in the country. We have young, bright minds who are prepared to come up. Our defense industry has stepped up. We have made an outreach to a number of uh, academic institutes, academia, to project our uh, issues. And they have come up with some very good solutions, which we are currently working on. What we are specifically also focusing is in the domain of artificial intelligence, quantum key distribution, uh, and the rest, blockchain. So as we go forward, our attempt is to leverage this potential that is available within the country and uh, see as to how best we can use you're, it. You're an engineer. You understand technology better than most generals uh, who've been chief so far, just by virtue of your bringing and your background. And I wonder how difficult it has been for you to transform the armed forces, given that this is thinking that's built in the DNA of the Indian armed forces, which is an infantry first, artillery, armored corps kind of thinking, to now having a more engineer first, no longer a support arm, but essentially the arm that could potentially decide the outcome on the battlefield. Since you mentioned of transformation, let me spend some time on as to how I visualize transformation taking place. Uh, transformation, largely, the way we look at it is to enable us to become a more modern, more agile, more battle-ready uh, force to be able to meet our future challenges in a more uh, effective manner. Largely, the purpose of the transformation that we're looking at is to increase our operational efficiencies and enhance operational effectiveness. And this transcends also into functional and administrative domains. I'm looking at transformation in five key areas. And the first one is force optimization and restructuring, wherein we're looking at the legacy establishments, legacy institutes, some of which may have lost relevance in the present day situation, to right size them so as to optimize manpower, get our tooth to tail ratio right. The second, of course, pillar is the modernization and technology inclusion. The third, and perhaps uh, equally important, is the human resource management about the Agnipath scheme, and of which we, maybe we can talk uh, later. Fourth is the jointness and integration. And fifth is further refining, modifying our systems, processes, as a functions. So these are the five key domains where we are looking at as to how transformation must take place. We have identified key deliverables, prepared a roadmap, laid down responsibilities. And while we are transforming, we are fully cognizant of the fact, considering our active borders, we can't let the guard down. So the operational readiness or preparedness has to continue to remain of a very high level while all this is happening. We've seen in Russia and China, to some extent in Pakistan, they just bring the best tech minds, young, fresh tech minds, not necessarily trained at the National Defense Academy or the IMA, but young, bright tech minds to help and play a role in cyber warfare. We don't do this at scale. We do it in bits and drives, but we don't do it at scale. Is that something that you hope to push through, bring in uh, young technologists and have them play a role in national security, especially in cyber warfare? No, no, absolutely. And uh, one of the things that we are looking at is in the niche domains where you take long time to train and become an expert, such as cyber or even, let us say, uh, Mandarin language. We are looking at recruiting young, bright boys and girls into the army. We have made a beginning by recruiting them in the territorial army. We have started with uh, Mandarin-speaking uh, you know, officers who are coming in. And subsequently, we will graduate towards those who are experts in the cyber domain and the rest. At the soldier level, our aim is through the Agnipath scheme, 
try and get in as many technical uh, you know youth technologically adapt youth who are either iti qualified or have been through the polytechnic so the overall threshold in understanding on technical issues of our soldier enhances so that has been one of our key areas one of your key areas is, is to implement the agni veer scheme we saw a lot of backlash on the streets from the opposition when the scheme was first announced how has the implementation been so far and to what extent do you believe sir this will help cut the flab of the indian army and make it a more lean mean fighting machine let me start by saying even at the cost of repetition i think this is a transformational reform which will bring, which has brought about a paradigm shift in the way our human resource men resource management was taking place i would not go into the benefits of the scheme because i think it has been discussed and talked about at length but i think it is a win win situation not only for us as the military but also for the society and the country at large but what i believe is getting the implementation right is the key and that is what currently we are focusing on as you are aware the first two batch of agni veers have already started their training at the respective regimental <laughs> centers in the next batch we have even modified our intake wherein we will now have a combined entrance exam online exam first and the medical and the physical uh, later uh, so the agni veer the initial feedback what i get from the regimental centers is the youth who have come up are very enthusiastic energetic there is lot of positivity so i think that's a very good sign but as we go forward there are five six issues which we need to be very cognizant of the initial training of the recruits since we have compressed the time frame that is very critical and that is where again we are bringing in simulators and other technological means to account for this compressing in time secondly we have to make sure then with the agni veers join our units combat units their assimilation and integration and acceptance into the system happens well and that is where i think the role of junior leaders right from a jco up to a company commander battalion commander that comes in well most importantly since it's a new scheme it's a unique scheme we have to constantly keep our ear to the ground so that we have a mechanism of feedback and we will bring about any positive constructive changes modification to the scheme to make it happen i want to spend some time on the state of play at the line of actual control this has been one of the contested issues on the political domain where the charges that the government of the day the armed forces haven't been transparent about the actual situation on the line of line of actual control between india and china as the man whose primary task it is to keep all of us safe can you give us a sense of play of how the situation is in your view across the line of actual control and especially in debsang and demchok the two sectors where the indian and the chinese armies are still uh, not been able to disengage right so overall i would say that the situation along the line of actual control is stable but we need to keep a very close watch on the situation as it uh, develops as far as the deployment of forces on by the adversary is concerned uh, there has been no significant reduction in the deployment there have laid great focus on modernization of forces especially those deployed opposite the line of actual control the infrastructure development on the other side is coming about at a very hectic pace be it the road infrastructure in terms of the highways which run along the lac be it the upgradation of airfields and heliports or in fact uh, the shiakong villages the border villages 682 out of which are planned to come up now these are some uh, major developments which we take to uh, uh, need to take note of especially in the context of the adversary's ability to mobilize troops uh, so that is one as far as what we are doing i think we have a very robust deployment all along the lac in all the three sectors and i must also mention we have adequate reserves to deal with any contingencies 
with the infusion of new technology, new weapon systems, our capability development is an ongoing endeavor. Equally, we are focusing on infrastructure development, especially forward area roads, helipads, etc. So overall, I think in terms of our deployment is robust, our preparedness levels are high. From the winter months as we now transit into the summer months, so we have undertaken minor changes as you would do in a summer posture. So this in a nutshell is the situation. As far as resolution of outstanding issues, you know, through diplomatic and military talks and process of dialogue, we have been able to resolve certain friction points. Some are still remaining. At the military level, you have the senior higher military commanders conf uh, meetings, which last happened in December. And you have the WMCC, which is a more at a political level, or the diplomatic level, which happened sometime in February. So as we continue to talk and engage with the other side at these parallel levels, uh, I think we can look for resolution as we go forward. Beijing seems to be sending the message that this is the new normal, that things are where they believe things should be. What's your assessment of the enemy's strategic objective? Second, do you think this is the new normal, that the LAC will be like the line of control where the army will be deployed 24-7 at high altitudes regardless of the weather? See, there is an SEO summit mid-year, then the leadership summit uh, of the G20 nations in September, Xi Jinping likely to come to India. Uh, India being very clear that the current situation along the LAC is not acceptable. Does that offer a window uh, possibly for resolution? Do you think we just have to brace up for China being boots on the ground uh, across the line of actual control and that is the new reality the Indian Army needs to contend with? Like I mentioned, it is only through dialogue and talking to each other that we can uh, find resolution. And uh, in the balance friction point, that is what our uh, aim and endeavor is. And till that time happens, uh, till such time that happens, I think our deployment of forces, our alertness level will continue to remain uh, of a very high level. For the longest time, India's military posture was more towards Pakistan than towards China. Now the Pakistani army for the first time in its institutional history being challenged and questioned from within. How does that impact your understanding of what's happening along the line of control between India and Pakistan? Has the threat from Pakistan to some extent come down given the internal challenges that the Pakistani army is facing and given the fact that at the political and military level India has made very clear that if there is to be any kind of terror attack on Indian soil, there will be consequences the Pak army will need to deal with. Right, so in terms of the domestic situation in Pakistan, be it the political instability, the economic downturn, or the internal security challenges, all that uh, notwithstanding, I think we need to be extremely alert in terms of what happens on the line of control as well as further down on the international boundary. As far as present situation goes, uh, along the LC, we have a very robust counter infiltration grid. There has been reduction in infiltration attempts, but what we see is because of our effective infiltration grid in the valley, you find more attempts towards the international border sector further south. Also the use of drones for sort of, uh, shall I say, putting across explosive material, weapon system, drugs, is another trend that we have noticed. But largely the infiltration, I would say the numbers have uh, significantly reduced. But what is also uh, of concern is that there is no major significant reduction in the terror infrastructure on the other side. The reports tell us that the camps do exist. And so we, I mean, the attempts uh, for at infiltration might continue, of course, to which we are uh, well prepared. In the hinterland, uh, in the Jammu Kashmir area, I think there has been significant, again, reduction in violence parameters. We've also noticed a change in strategy from the other side, wherein you now have certain proxy Tanzims who have come up, and they're targeting, uh, or they're resorting to targeted killings. I feel largely to make it visible and to gain more publicity and visibility. But I think in concert with other security agencies, uh, we are doing well there and making sure that the 
you know, situation remains stable, the environment is secure for a number of de development initiatives and other activities. You know, it's also interesting, progress. I don't know if you've noticed, how there is so much commentary in Pakistan comparing the bank balances of Pak Army generals with those of the Indian Army. I'm not going to get into what those reports say, but there's a lot of discomfiture in Pakistan when they compare the crores and crores and all the land backs that Pak Army generals have built in comparison with the Indian Armed Forces, and thank God for that, General. I want to ask you about the idea of Atmanirbhar Armed Forces, which is a key push towards indigenization. The concern is, does this then put the armed forces at the disadvantage of having to do with technology which isn't at the very cutting edge? If you bought something in an international tender, you could potentially pick the latest technology available to you. If you're building those capacities internally, it's fantastic in the long run, but in the short to medium term, does it disadvantage you? In response to your first question, I mentioned one of the lessons from the Russia-Ukraine conflict was that unless countries are self-reliant, unless they have secure supply chains, it will be difficult for them to address security challenges as we move forward in the future. And to that extent, I think the focus on Atmanirbharta or self-reliance uh, is, is extremely, it's, it's a positive step. And there are a number of benefits uh, in doing so, which I don't have to recount here. But suffice to say that as far as we in the military are concerned, we are fully complementing the overall focus. We are doing or playing our role well in terms of being facilitators of government policy, in terms of providing a viable market. And the figures will tell you for the last couple of years, our emphasis on Atmanirbhar or indigenous products uh, has been uh, significant. In so far as your question of, uh, I mean, the reduction on dependence on the import during this interim period, yes, that's a very relevant point. But I'm happy to say that even the indigenous industry has stepped up and we are extremely hopeful and positive that this gap, uh, we will be able to address it in a very satisfactory manner. I, I want you all to notice uh, the general's new combat fatigues, very different from the combat fatigues you would have seen growing up and this is also in some ways a more digital print that you have. There are tanks and ships different, at different places in these fatigues and I'm told that you have an IPR for this, sir. Well, I mean, this is today is Friday and this is the dress of the day as far as we are concerned. So across the army on Fridays, uh, we wear the combat uniform. And this is something which we got it uh, designed in a very technical manner with all the experts putting their heads. And uh, this is going to be our uniform for the future, wherein we will introduce it in a phased manner uh, based on the production capacities and the rest of it. Yes. It's also a digital print at a time when you are fighting a digital war and to have an engineer, as I started this session by saying, at the helm of the armed forces uh, is very significant because you think differently from the others and that's the kind of different thinking that we need to shape the preparation of our armed forces, General Manoj Pandey, for coming to the inaugural session of the India Today Conclave and for helping us get off to such a, a, fi a fantastic start. Thank you very much. Really appreciate your time and we wish you and the armed forces all the very best. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Rahul.